tests, right? This is a good test where you can't get anything wrong. Um, so, uh, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Huh? Uh, because I look at them to see how I'm doing as an instructor. So we get feedback on things we could do better, things we're doing well. Just for general feedback. Um, it's a good idea to get feedback usually. So, um, all right. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, okay. So, does um, does anybody have any questions from the homework before we get going? I know some. We haven't quite got to all the material yet, but we're going to cover a good chunk of it today. Because um, last week we basically talked about how to use the Z table and use that to assess probabilities with normal distributions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on chapter seven. Yeah. Um, where it says look use technology or something. On like fifteen. Oh really? Okay. And then it says like what to do there. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Let's see. Um. I I I think you can still use. Uh, you should still be able to use the Z table to get the correct answer, uh, I believe. I could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, or you could pull it up from like uh, it's usually uh, maybe one of the problems. Yeah, you can always get it out of the appendix. Here, here's a on the next problem, you can pull it up. Um, so like you're looking for the. Uh, oh, that's nice and small. Cool. Can I expand that at all? Anyways. But uh, you're looking for the 78th percentile, so it looks like it's going to happen somewhere around here-ish. Um, is that right? Or is the is it the 78th percentile? Oh, the area that lies between two two categories. So you'd be looking up Z 1.76 and negative 1.76, and you'd be getting that. You could still use the table. There are ways. There are ways. Oh, I'm sorry. The other one. Yeah, this one. The 78th percentile. Um, There, there's ways to get it otherwise, um, using like for example StatCrunch. So, if you open up StatCrunch, don't bop that. I'll show you this. So you don't always have to use. It. I, I would recommend using the Z table just because that's what you'll have as a resource on your uh, test. We won't have StatCrunch available to us. But if you do go in there, if you go under stat and you go into uh, calculators, and there's one that says normal. So you can actually go into that normal calculator, and then you can actually go. Um, so, like, they wanted to know the probability that Z, so Z has a mean zero standard deviation one, the probability that it was, say, greater than or equal to, I think the, the, the problem was, uh, what, 0 0.78 to the left. To the left, so that'd be less than. So you go over there and put in 0 0.78, and you could. It was actually less than. And actually, it'll compute it for you. So that rather than having to look up 0 0.78 on the Z table, you would just use this solution. But if you look up 0 0.78 on the Z table, say like there's another one here on the this table right here. If you look up the Z score 0 0.7 um, eight zero one two three four five six seven eight. It's point seven eight two three, which I believe is the same thing uh, our calculator said. So you get the same answer either way. You can use that calculator, but you don't actually need it. Okay. Yeah. Good question. All right. Any other questions from the homework? Especially chapter seven because we're just barely getting into chapter eight. Uh, chapter seven homework. 26, you said, or 27? 26. 26. Okay, assume that you have something with a, a normal distribution, a mean of 50, standard deviation of 7. Compute probabilities. So we want the probability of um, that x is between 53 and 69. Um, so what we're looking for is well, it's going to be here, Look, I think, like right here. So we're 53 and 69 are above the mean. We want it to be between, so it looks like probably C. 
is what we're looking for here, right? 53 and 69. Um, okay, that's probably not your question though, I would guess, right? Yeah, your question comes later. So they want you to actually do the probability. So what we need is, uh, how do we tackle a problem like this? How do we do this? I'm actually going to do the new one. Yeah, we need to find some z-scores here. So like, um, we need to first, so the mean was, what was the mean, 50? So the mean was 50. The standard deviation was 7. And they wanted the probability of seeing x between, I think, 53 and 69. Okay. So uh, what we need is we need some z-scores here. So we need to get a z-score for 53 and 69. So our first z-score is going to be uh, 53 minus 50 over 7 and I can pull out my calculator you guys got anybody you guys got calculators here <coughs> okay you I'll let you guys do it because you're faster than me so 53 minus 50 over 7 that's 3 over 7 which comes out to be what 0.4 round of 4.3 yeah make sure you do the subtraction on top first then divide by 7 yeah and then uh, the other z-score is going to be for 69. So 69 minus 50 over 7, that gives us a what? 2.71. 2.71 if you round it. Other people get that? 2.71 rounded to two decimal places. So we always go two decimal places because of the table. All right. So then what we're, really, we're going to do is rather than look at the probability between 53 and 69, we need the probability on the Z table, we're going to go and get the probability between 2.71 and 0 0.43. Okay. Well, how do you do an in-between probability? Don't you uh, look up the Z score, uh, the thing for 0.43 and then the one for uh, uh, 2.71, but instead of 2.71, you subtract it from 1 and then you add them together? No, you just subtract. Yeah, subtracting from one is when you want like top tail probabilities, um, because the lower tail gives you the table gives you lower probabilities. So we would only subtract from one if we want upper probabilities. If we want in between, typically we take the big probability and then we subtract off the lower tail that we don't want. So we do still need to go to the table for both of these. the The way this is going to be is we need to get it's it's going to be the probability that z is less than 2.71 that's going to be the big probability but then we're going to subtract off the probability that z is less than 0 0.43 because that's going to be this lower probability that we want to get rid of so, so you, said, you, said, uh, you subtract the lower probability from the larger yeah the smaller probability from the larger okay. yeah okay so we'll take the big one so we go to our table so 2.71 okay it's going to be small, sorry. Uh, we're going to go up to 2.71. 2.701, it looks like it's 0.9966. 0.9966. And then go to 0 0.43. Be up here, 0 0.401236664 is what it says. Okay, and then that's going to end up being something. I don't, I don't know what that is. 0 0.3302. Is that right? Yeah, I think that would be our solution. Um, moment of truth. Oops, got rid of it, sorry. 3302, let's try it. Okay. Cool. All right. Did that help answer your question? Okay, so you always take, you get the z-scores first, then you always, then if you're doing it in between, you take the big probability and you subtract off the lower probability you want to get rid of. Okay? Cool. Any other questions? That's a good refresher of what we did on uh, whatever that day was we met last. <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> All right. All right, any other questions? All right, so we're going to go... We're going to look at some new stuff now. 
And um, I couldn't find my chapter 8 notes, so I'm just going to write them by hand, but that's going to be alright. So they won't be nice and typed, but we'll all survive. So, I'll do Math 146, chapter 8. Yay. Okay. So, um, what I want to look at now is, I want to consider, so, so, so far, we, we know for uh, x, say, has a normal, right? Then we can calculate probabilities like the probability of x between a and b. Uh, we can do that using the z table, right? So that's the example we just did. Okay, but but the thing about this is that this is this is when you only randomly select one one individual, right? This is like this is the probability of seeing uh, one observation in that range. Okay. Well, the thing is, is that in statistics, are we ever really just like picking one thing to observe? No, that would be pretty bad practice. We're actually going to be uh, picking a lot of things to observe, right? So, in practice, right, what are we going to do? We're not going to pick one. We're going to pick or sample many individuals. And then what are we going to do with those mini observations? Those multiple observations? What would we do? Like we kind of talked about this in chapter something, three. What do we do with our data once we have it? We have a bunch of data points. Like I have the value of a bunch of cars at CBC. What, did you, what do we do with all those values? We average them. So we do things like we average them or we calculate percentages about them. Like with the trucks, we looked at a bunch of trucks and cars and we said, you know, uh, how many are trucks? And we calculated percentage from that. Okay, so what we're normally going to do is we're going to pick a lot of individuals and we're going to calculate statistics about them. So things like a mean or say a proportion, right? I could calculate the average salary of CBC students, or I could calculate what percent of CBC students uh, plan to vote in the upcoming election or something like that, right? A single number that says something about the population. All right, so what I want to do is, is, is I want to have some idea. If you're going to go out there and you're going to collect a bunch of data and you're going to calculate statistics, what I want to know is uh, what's going to happen, how does that statistic, the number itself, the average, behave? Because here's the thing, all right? So let's say you go out and, um, okay, so for example, let's, look, let's collect some data. So I want to look at a data set here. I want to look at the number of siblings per student in this room, okay? So, uh, so I'll, let's go around and let's just, I want to know the, po so let's treat our, our class like a population. I want to know how many siblings you have, right? So um, that would be, Children in is it that is it that many? <laughs> so uh, is there you count up the number in your family, like brothers and sisters, that aren't you because you're not your own sibling, okay? And then tell me how many siblings you have, uh, and we'll go around the room. You can decide whether or not to count step siblings if you want, or I don't really care. Just tell me how many siblings you consider yourself to have, okay? We'll just go front to back. So how many siblings you got? One. Yeah, one sibling, okay? Five. Five, okay? Nine. Three. Two. Oh, who said two? two? Yeah, we'll come back around there, okay? Three. Two. Three. 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 Four. Four. Two. Two. How many symbols you got? Ten. Ten. Okay. Two. Six. Four. Four. Zero. Zero. Seven. Seven. Two. Two. Seven. Two. One. 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 None. Seven that we know of. Okay. Eight. One. All right. Did I get everybody? Okay. So, so if 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 you treat this, this is like our entire population, right? Um, say this is our entire population. 
which inevitably there's always someone with eight to ten siblings, like in almost every one of my classes. It's like only one, but there's always somebody. Yeah. Actually, a lot of times though, I don't get a lot of students who have no siblings. That's actually it's really interesting. I always see someone with eight to ten siblings, but I almost I I do see classes with uh, that don't have anybody with no siblings. So, anyways, the point is though, let's treat this as our population. Okay. And um, if we if you look at this as our population, then what's the actual mean number of siblings? Okay. So so a couple people with a calculator calculate the, and this is a true mean, right? If our if our class is our population, we can calculate exactly the average number of siblings of students in this room right this very second. Okay? So how many is it? Add them all up and divide by however many that is. Let's see. I'll count how many there are. You add them up. 4 8 <laughs> 26, no, 369. I think that's 29 numbers there. So add them all up, divide by 29, tell me what you get. And any takers? Yeah, there's 29 students there. So once you add them all up. 3.17? 3.17? I got two. Can I get a third? Can I get a third? 3.17 going once, going twice. I'm going. I'm writing it down. You can confirm it as you finish it. So we have. Well, I'm not including this sample, but as students, you have an average of 3.17 siblings. So just a little over three. Okay. So that's the average number. Of course, now is the average really a, necessarily a good measure of center for this data set? No, because how do you get 0.17 of the siblings? <laughs> okay. Uh, Point point taken, but you, okay, you can't. But but that wasn't really what I was thinking of. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe you only acknowledge seventeen percent of their existence or something. I don't know. But anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, so the there's another problem though, actually, with the average here. I think. What would be? What's the problem here? There's a couple zeros in there. I'm not super concerned with that. We had a conversation about the mean versus the median. And what, how did that conversation go and what did we decide? Um, the mean is always skewed. The, the, yeah, if there's outliers in your data set or you had a skewed distribution, um, then the mean is not the best measure because it gets heavily affected by outliers. If you just had to guess what, what direction this, does this look like a skewed distribution or symmetric or what? To me, this looks skewed, right? Because to me, it looks like you have a whole bunch of people down here between, say, like 0 to 3, right? And then you have a few people out here and not as many. So my guess is probably the distribution looks something like that, right? It's skewed. And so actually, this mean is probably being dragged up a little bit by the outliers. Anyways, that's not that important. But that's the true mean. Okay, there are, for this classroom, we have an average of 3.17 siblings, so just over 3. Now, what I want to think about, though, is that let's say that I didn't allow you, let's say I didn't allow you to sample everybody in this room. I said, I want you to guess the number of siblings or the average number of siblings of people in this room, but you can't talk to everybody. Uh, you can only, say, sample five people. Okay. So let's say I'm only allowed to sample five people in this room. And uh, let's say I use a systematic approach. What's going to happen every time I take a sample? Whoa, hey buddy, where'd you go? Come back. Okay, what's going to happen every time we resample here? What's going to happen to my, I can only talk to five people. And I'm going to maybe average their, eight, their number of siblings, but what's going to happen each time? The average could change, right? So let's say I take like a systematic approach. So I'm looking for five people and I have five rows. So I just take everyone down the aisle seat, okay? So maybe of that side. So we'll start here. So how many siblings do you have? Okay. And then, Ronelli, how many siblings do you have? Uh, two. And then over here, going down the edge here? Zero. None? And Brittany, how many did you have? Seven. Seven. And then how much you have? 
7. So if that was my sample, what's my sample mean for this sample of 5 people? 4.2. Okay. Okay, so let's say I take another approach and uh, maybe I go with a systematic approach but I just do every other person starting, I don't know, in the back corner, okay? So how many siblings do you have? One. One. And then, and then, uh, no, I was going every other. So we'll go there, and then maybe Emma, I got you again in this sample, so seven. We'll skip, and then over here in the back corner, how many got? One. One. And then we'll skip you to Maddie. How many do you have, Maddie? One. One. And then we'll skip another person over to, say, Brittany, how many do you have? Seven, okay. What's the sample mean of this sample? Three point four, right? And what's going to happen? What's going to happen if I sample a third time? And the fourth time, and a fifth time. Every single time I take a sample, the sample mean is going to change, right? In fact, how many possible samples are there? Yeah, there's how many ways? So that's a big number, right? So there's 29 choose 5 ways that I can sample 5 people in this class right now. And every single time I do it, I'm going to get potentially a, different, a slightly different average, right? Okay, so this is a problem, though, because... If you take a sample, say that you didn't have the pre, you didn't have the knowledge ahead of time. What, say that you don't know this, right? I mean, this is how statistics really works. In the real world, I don't get to know the true mean ahead of time. Otherwise, a sample is a complete waste of time. So in the real world, I just have to go out and take a sample and get a sample mean. But how do, you, how do I know, how do I know whether my sample contained a bunch of people with a lot of siblings or potentially a bunch of people with not a lot of siblings or potentially a bunch of people all over the place? Can you actually know that when you take your sample? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Is your sample mean overestimating it? Is it underestimating? We don't know, right? So this is a problem. Also, is it ever going to actually be the true mean? It's never actually even going to be the true mean. So if I came to you and I said, hey, your job is to estimate the average number of siblings in class right now, but you can only talk to five people. So you talk to five people, you come back to me, you take this sample and you say, okay, Ryan, the average number of siblings in this class, um, from my sample, it looks like it's about 4.2 siblings. Also, by the way, that's actually not the truth. I'm sorry. Right? So what good is the mean? Because you're taking it. It's giving you some information, but you also have to acknowledge that it's probably not actually the true mean at all. Right? Okay. So we have a problem. So what we need to know is, what we want to know in Chapter 8 is... How does, say, the sample mean x bar behave? So how does the sample mean behave? And uh, the example I want to look at, I want to look at uh, a data set I have with the heights of, I think it's five-year-old females at a clinic. So I want to take a look at this. Uh, I have it. In, I loaded up in Stat Crunch. Did we look at this one already? Yeah. Okay, I think we did. I can't remember why we looked at it, but we were looking at normal distribution, right? So this is um, seventy something, I think. No, eighty. Okay, so there's eighty. There's eighty uh, five year olds here. They measured their heights. We looked at a nice histogram of their heights, and uh, what did we notice about it? has a nice bell-shaped normal distribution to it, so that's nice. Okay. Now what I want to imagine is, let's say that this is the population. Let's see what happens when I'm only allowed to sample a few people. So let's say that I can only um, sample maybe, let's say not that many we think, like maybe five. Okay. So let's say that I can only sample um, five of these girls at a time to measure their height. I'm not allowed to measure all 80 of them. But I still want to estimate their average height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine 
let's uh let's go sample size five and let's do this like uh a whole bunch of times okay so uh i don't know how many times let's do it a thousand times this is the nice thing about computers okay boom it's gonna like go nuts on me for a second oh is it not gonna handle that i think it can handle that come on stack crunch you can do it maybe a thousand's too many oh great I broke it. No, it'll, it's just going to yell at me in a second. It's going to send me a code error. Oh, hey, it worked. Aha. Had no faith. So actually what it did is it's a mess right now, but if you'll notice, look what it did. So all it did is it picked up five random heights and then another five random heights and then another five random heights and then another five random and blah, blah, blah. I did it a thousand times. But actually what I want to do is I want to know the averages. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do summary stats for uh, columns, okay, and and I want to take all of those. So I want to average all thousand of those samples. All I want is the mean, okay, and all it's, it's going to spit out this uh, table at the end, right? So what it did is for the first sample it calculated their mean height, for the second sample it calculated their mean height, and it did that a thousand times. All right, so let's rename this. This was uh, this was x. We'll call it x bar sample mean when we looked at when we were only allowed to sample five people. All right. Now what I want to do is uh, I want to I want to delete a bunch of stuff. Oh, edit. Um, dang, how did I? Now I'm just making my life harder. Delete rows. So I don't need all these rows in between. I'm gonna kill those samples and blah 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 blah. Okay, that's all I need. So now I have. Oh, what happened here? How come? Oh. oh, good point. Did I just do the wrong thing? Columns. Oh, I don't know why. I didn't. Anyways, all right. So I want to do this. Okay, so this would be only me. So let's look at what happened here. So if I look at the histograms of this data, here's the original heights. Here was the means after I was allowed to sample five people. And uh, I want to go, I want to stack them on top of each other. Um, that'd be rows. Okay. And I want to use the same uh, y, x axis. Okay. So the top is our original distribution, the bottom is the distribution of all those sample means. So what's the difference? How are they the same? And how are they different? In some ways they are different. In some ways they are the same. The means, notice the means are, are a lot less variable, right? The means are kind of all piled up a little closer to uh, the true mean. Yeah? Does that make sense? Does that make sense that sample averages would be closer to average than the people themselves? Does it make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. Why? Why does that make sense? It's the more data that's, the average is a gathering of all the numbers, so if you have more data towards the center, it's gonna pull the average towards the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because here, here it's like you're only allowed to pick one person. They're going to be all over the place. But in this one, we were able to pick five people and average them out. So some of the taller people are getting averaged out with the shorter people, and we're getting closer to the average, right? Okay, now, what's going to happen if I do a bigger sample? What do you think is going to happen? So let's say I go back to them, but now I'm allowed to pick, uh, what are there's 80 of them? Let's say I'm allowed to pick uh, 20 of them. Now I'll allow you to measure 20 of the girls and then guess the average height. What do you think is going to happen here? Let's see. So I'm allowed to take 20 people now. I don't know if I want to do a thousand last and again because that kind of broke the. Kind of got mad at me last time. Let's try. Oh, 100 is not cool enough. Though. Let's try 500. It's probably still going to yell at me. Let's see if it can do it. So now what it's going to do is it's going to go and it's going to resample 20 heights 500 times. And uh, oh, it did it. There you go. So now it just tagged on another blah, 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 a bunch of other more. So each of those is a random sample of 20 heights. 
So again, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to go for uh, summary stats. I want the sample mean of all of these heights. Ooh. Just the mean. Store it in the table. Compute. Great. Thank you. All these means. So we'll call these. Uh, we'll call this x bar when uh, n was 20 this time. Oh, 20. All right. And then I'll go ahead and get in here, and I don't need the, uh, the all those columns. So everything from here um, down to here, I can kill. Boom. All right. So there you go. Now let's look at what happened. Anybody want to take a stab at it? What do you think is going to happen? What's it going to look like? Is it going to look the same or is it going to look different? How's it going to be different? It's going to be different. More spread out, less spread out. We'll see. Boom. Less spread out. Right? Does that make sense? Because we were allowed to sample more people, right? So the more people you sample, the more con the closer the sample mean is going to be to the truth, right? And that kind of makes sense. Now notice, are they all centered around pretty much the same value? Yeah, yeah they're all centered right around what? 40, 42-ish? Yeah? Around 42 and a half? Yeah? What's the actual mean of this data set? I don't know if you guys remember. Anybody want to guess what it is? I bet it's pretty close. It's 42.2. Yeah. So notice that they're all, not only is it like the more you, the more you take, the more samples you take, you, the sample mean gets condensed, but it's also condensing around the true mean, right? You're getting closer and closer to the true mean. Now, what do you also notice about the distributions, all of them? What's true about all the distributions? They're all bell-shaped. They're all bell-shaped. Do we know how to calculate probabilities of bell-shaped curves? Sure, we use a z-score and a z-table, right? And so not only are the sample means nice in the sense that the more you take, the less variable they are, but they also have a normal distribution, okay? And this is, not, this is important. So, so this is the first result I want to point out, okay, is that um, if you look at the sample distribution, of the sample mean, okay, and then I'll put in here if your population, because notice we started with the population is normal, right? So it says that if you sample, say, in individuals, from a population with a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation sigma okay then the distribution of x-bar it'll also be approximately normal dude seriously come on now I must be bumping something I bet the cords coming out will be sorry approximately normal with, and this is the important part, okay? So the mean of the sample mean, like the center of the sample mean, is going to be centered around the true mean, mu. And the standard deviation of that normal distribution after you've taken those samples is going to be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Oops. Okay, and that's the important part there. Okay. 
So this tells you that, so this is like the center, right? The mean of the sample, it's like the mean of the sample mean, the center of the sample mean. So it's going to be centered around the true mean, and it's going to have a standard deviation equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Okay? So that's the nice thing about the sample mean. It has that nice normal distribution. Okay? All right. Great question. Now, this is this is considering. Notice we started with normal. We started with normal data. Okay, we started with a normal population. Now, now the problem is is that typically your populations aren't normally distributed. Okay, so so the question becomes. Okay, well, what happens to this if your population is non-normal, right? What if you have a non-normal population? So I have another data set to show you. All right. So let's say that, uh, I think, where is it here? So I look at, um, this was a data set of profits of small businesses in a municipality. And I think it's in thousands of dollars or something, or hundreds of dollars. Um, so let's look at yearly profits for these different businesses. Now, if we look at the graph, so let's perform a histogram of their profits. Uh, what's true about the distribution of their profits? It's skewed. It's skewed, and it's skewed to the right, which is not surprising. Okay, you would have assumed probably a majority of businesses make some profit, not a ton, and then there's a few businesses that are going to be more profitable. Okay, so that's not super surprising. Okay, so what I want to do is a similar thing to what we just looked at. What happens if I start sampling businesses and averaging them out? So from those businesses, let's say that I sampled uh, maybe only like uh, five at a time, like last time. I'll only do 100 just for expediency here. So I'm just going to sample five businesses. Uh, let StatCrunch do it for me. Okay, so each of these is a random sample of five. And again, I'm going to do those uh, summary stats. So for all of those samples, I want to calculate their mean, sort of the data table, data table compute. And I'll go ahead and get rid of everything I don't need. So I don't need all those samples anymore. I really only care about uh, the means. Okay, so this was uh, this was x bar when n was five. Okay, so let's compare the graphs now. If I go to histogram, this was the original population. This is my uh, sample means, and we go uh, stack them on top of each other. And uh, what do you notice after sampling five businesses? Uh, what what's happened here? Yeah, we started with a pretty skewed distribution. Um, and by the time we took five samples and averaged them out, actually our averages are starting to look a lot less skewed. Right? You can see the skewedness has almost gone away. You can, all, you can still see it a little bit. Right? You can still see that skewedness just a little in that distribution. What do you think will happen if I do more samples, though? What do you think? Let's see. So let's say I instead I sample uh, 30. Let's say I sample 30 businesses. I'll do that 100 times. Uh, and again, I'm going to go do their mean. So summary stats for columns. I'll take the mean of all those. Do, do, do. Means, please. Compute. Oh, whoops. Options. Edit. I need to store it in the table. Compute. Perfect. And then uh, again, I'll get rid of all that stuff I don't need. So I don't need all these samples anymore. All I care about were their means. All right, and so we'll call this, uh, this was x bar and n was equal to 30. All right, perfect. Now let's stack them up. So histograms, one on top of the other, and that means I'm gonna need three rows. Put them on the same x-axis, compute, boom. What do you notice happened here? It's hard to see. I did. I should have probably done more than 100. But what do you notice? It got way close together. It got way condensed. Do you really see much evidence of skewedness at this point? Not really. Not really. I mean, there's some missing points there, but the overall the overall shape, to me, looks pretty pretty normal. The skewedness is pretty much gone. 
um, by the time I took 30 samples and averaged them out. What do you notice? What is that centered on? What is that distribution? Where does it look like the center of this is? Maybe around about 1,500, maybe 1,400, yeah. somewhere in there. What do you think the true mean is for all of these businesses? Somewhere between I bet it's around that. Let's try it. So if we do just the mean of our actual profits, there you go. It's 1,392. It's like exactly 1,400. So this is actually pretty impressive because uh, you think about this. It's like it doesn't actually matter what, you, what distribution you start with. As long as you take enough samples and average them out, not only is that mean going to be centered around the true mean, so it's nice and uh, it's like condensing around the truth, but it also starts to take on a normal distribution the more samples you take. Okay, And this is actually something called, uh, well, where am I going here? This is the central limit theorem. Okay, And it says that no matter what, the central limit theorem says if x um, is a random variable. Oh, huh, you guys don't know the abbreviation. Of course you don't, because we've never covered this before. <laughs> Woo, that was fun. Um, central limit theorem. I'm just abbreviating things. Um, Central limit theorem. Okay. So it says that for if you have a random variable with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, okay, for large enough sample size. X bar will be approximately normal and it's those two results we saw before will still hold. The sample mean will still be centered around the true mean. The sample standard deviation will still be sigma over root n. And, and now there's a key here. There's sort of a quantifier there, or qualifier. It says that your sample sizes have to be large enough. Okay. The the question uh, often comes up. Okay, so what is large enough? Okay, and it kind of just depends. So if the question is okay, what is large enough? Then typically what we say is we say if if the original population was normal, right, it doesn't actually matter. You just have to have two or more people because you need two people to calculate an average, right? But if X, if the original population is non-normal, that's actually okay. We typically see normality by the time you hit 30 samples. So by the time you've hit a sample size of 30, you're pretty much guaranteed to start to see approximate normality in your sample mean. Okay? So this is a central limit theorem. All right. And this is pretty powerful because it, it actually says it doesn't matter what your actual population looks like. If you're just going to take a big enough sample and start averaging things out, we know exactly how the population is going to behave or how the sample mean is going to behave. It's going to have a nice normal distribution. It's going to be centered around the true mean. And now we're getting to the point where we can start to really think about, okay, so what does that mean for the true mean? You know, I have the sample mean. I took a big sample. So now I know my true, my sample mean has got to be somewhere kind of close to the true mean. I don't yet know if it's over or under, but it's got to be close. Okay. Um, so we're about out of time. So tomorrow what we'll do is we're going to actually put the central limit theorem into action. I'm going to show you how we use that. We're going to go back to the Z tables. And uh, it's going to be great fun. Okay.